Hey everybody, so my favorite presidential candidate in a dark, ironic sense is Eric Swalwell. You may be familiar with Eric Swalwell as the candidate who is running, it seems, primarily on a platform of demanding incredibly invasive gun control measures, the kind that could conceivably, I don't know, provoke a civil war if enacted, and shrieking at the top of his lungs about Russia. Those are the two issues he's synthesized into a modus operandi for running for president. And he's a minor candidate. Nobody really thinks he has much of a chance at all. But he is amusing in the sense of he kind of embodies a type of sensibility that's become predominant in the age of Trump, so to say. He is emblematic of a form of elite liberalism that gets a lot of play, especially in the media, in particular on MSNBC, where Swalwell is a top contributor now, one of their most cherished and prized, no doubt. So it's for that reason that I've been following his candidacy with some interest, largely because I find it amusing, and also because it actually does say something about where at least sections of the party are. Now, who is... Eric Swalwell is a former prosecutor, so that obviously informs his worldview. That was best evidenced when he began calling for a new federal criminal statute to supposedly protect journalists from assault, intimidation, etc. Now, there was an incident that was widely publicized recently that many of you are probably aware of where this right-leaning journalist, Andy No, got attacked in Portland, Oregon. And what did Eric Swalwell do in response to that? He condemned the attack, you know, which is fair enough, but he also said that this actually gives extra impetus to his call for a brand new federal criminal statute to supposedly protect journalists. Now, I'm not sure if Eric is aware of this, but assault is already prohibited by law on the state level. So it's not as though journalists need a special statute to insulate them from assault because if you assault a journalist or anybody else, the same penalty. But Swalwell is so immersed in this kind of realm of punitive law that he looks at a social problem to the extent that it's a social problem at all. I don't see many journalists really in that much grave physical danger, but... Swalwell wants to address that by putting forth a new law, a new criminal law that will send people to prison. And a redundant law, because obviously it's totally unnecessary to further criminalize assault, which is already criminalized at every level it needs to be. Um, but that's, it's, a, it's an insight into Swalwell's mindset, which actually you can extrapolate into his position on, say, gun control. Now, gun control is a complex issue. It has a lot of implications for the extent to which we want to allow the state to intrude into private affairs. Many citizens are fervently against any governmental action whatsoever that would deprive them of what they perceive to be their Second Amendment rights. So at the very least, you got to handle that issue quite gingerly. And even a bipartisan, relatively anodyne proposal in 2013, after the Newtown school massacre was not passed by the Senate. So for Swalwell to basically get go around saying that he wants to take these radical steps to curb gun violence and restrict gun ownership shows you that he's operating in a realm that doesn't allow him to be cognizant of the consequences of what he's actually advocating. So in the debate last week, night two, that he comically was able to get on stage for, one of his big, you know, shining moments was to say that he was going to go further than any other, other of the Democratic candidates in the area of gun control and enact a, (coughs) 
excuse me, and enact a nationwide gun confiscation program. Okay? Not a voluntary program, which a lot of people advocate. Not something that would kind of around the margins, maybe tinker with the legal framework for gun ownership. No. Swalwell wants a mandatory gun confiscation program. I'm not exaggerating. Now, what would that do? It would probably cause an armed rebellion. Okay, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it would cause extreme strife of the story that we've never really seen in the United States because something that extreme has never been pursued. Um, and it just brought to mind to me, okay, I guess this would be a fitting end to the American Republic. Eric Swalwell, as president, telling you that the you know government agents are going to raid your home and stake, take your guns. Imagine the reception to that proposal and imagine somebody of Swalwell's stature trying to actually implement that proposal. It would be a nightmare. Um, but again, it kind of gives you some perspective on the political orientation that somebody like Swalwell has. He's not against invasive government action. He just wants his priorities to be the ones dictating what invasive government action is taken, even in social realms. And, you know, gun ownership obviously has bearing on a lot of social functions in the United States. But, you know, he's a prosecutor. He's used to wielding that power, the punitive power of the state to penalize people. So why not penalize gun owners and make them hand over their prized possessions in a way that could conceivably create some kind of actual unrest. So that was the moment that uh, Swalwell tried to fundraise on, essentially, when he crept into the debate last, uh, last week. And another one was when he made a pure generational argument against Joe Biden. He had to interject because obviously nobody really takes Swalwell seriously except me. I take him seriously insofar as he makes me laugh and he is representative of a type of disposition in the Democratic electorate. <clears throat> but if, you, if you're watching the debate, you'll know that Swalwell, you know, cheerily interjected at one point and said that when he was young, a young senator came to the California Democratic Convention and said it was time to pass the torch to a new generation, and that was Joe Biden, and it's time to pass the torch. So notice that Swalwell wasn't making a political argument against Joe Biden, so to say, or at least an argument that was based on the substance of what Biden was proposing. Swalwell was saying the torch should be passed to me or somebody of my generation purely by dint of our date of birth, which is kind of the most shallow and contentless argument that you can make in in terms of who deserves to have political power. Yeah, maybe Joe Biden is old, but you can't just say that, you know, if you basically agree with Joe Biden on his policy proposals... You can't then simply say that I'm the better one to enact those proposals simply because I was born a few decades later. Or at least you can say it, but it shouldn't be regarded as a compelling argument. It should be regarded as a very superficial and cheap attack line that obviously Swalwell calculated will get him some ben- some points. And it actually, I mean, at least in my estimation, didn't really because it was one of the few times in the debate where Joe Biden actually had a sharp retort. Um, in con- in contrast with much of his other performance over the course of that debate, Biden said, I'm still holding on to that torch, champ, something to that effect. Um, which, you know, I guess you could make that argument that he is. Whatever the torch means, it's kind of useless symbolism in the first place. But that's kind of what Swalwell knows. But then, of course, the big issue on which Swalwell has truly distinguished himself is Trump-Russia. The only reason that Swalwell really has any kind of platform to speak of, and he doesn't really, I mean, he goes on cable news, he has a big, you know, he has a, you know, incendiary tweets every now and then. But to the extent that anybody knows who he is, it's largely because of his Russia comments. Um, 
Namely, that he is one of the few Democrats who are, on the whole, totally immersed in this kind of insane incendiary rhetoric with regard to Russia and Trump's relationship with Russia. But Swalwell goes further and, sa- and likens the, quote, attack on American democracy in 2016 to Pearl Harbor and 9-11. So let me read you a quote of Eric Swalwell's from July of 2018. Quote, FDR didn't meet with the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. George H.W. Bush didn't meet with Saddam after Iraq invaded Kuwait. And George W. Bush didn't meet with bin Laden after 9-11. So tell me, real Donald Trump, what does America get out of you meeting with Putin after he attacked us? So the only way in which that analogy could make even the remotest sense is if you believe that the attack that Russia supposedly carried out in 2016 is meaningfully tantamount to those other three incidents that he laid out in the tweet. Pearl Harbor, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, you know, however that's relevant, I'm not really sure. And then 9-11, okay? So you will have to, you'll have to contend that those are all of comparable magnitude with the election attack that took place in 2016, which, let's remember for the millionth time, consisted largely of Twitter bots, Facebook memes, and spearfished Gmail accounts, okay? So that's what Swalwell really is saying is regarded as equal in severity to actual physical warfare and sneak attacks, you know, Pearl Harbor. I mean, have you studied Pearl Harbor? Do you know what it is? I mean, do people for, have people forgotten 9-11? The fact that that comparison can be made by people who are in respectable society is absurd, but it really feeds into a certain um, craving on the part of segments of the democratic electorate, the kind that are following the ins and outs of the Mueller investigation very closely, or now the impeachment aspect of the Mueller investigation, um, the kind that are extremely riled up about Russia and have a very warped picture of what Trump is actually doing with regard to Russia, which is on the whole, on a policy level, belligerent. And contrary to the rhetoric that Trump espouses about wanting to get along with Russia, you know, actually, what Trump has done is increased animosity with Ru- between the United States and Russia by doing such things as sending lethal arms to Ukraine, canceling the INF Treaty, participating in gigantic NATO exercises in Russia's sphere of influence. The list goes on. So, the idea that Trump has a cozy relationship with Russia in the first place is very misplaced. But Swalwell identifies that as a niche that he can exploit to gain whatever traction he's able to to gain in the context of a presidential race. I mean, he gained enough, apparently, to at least get in the debates, um, which, you know, that might be his last debate, frankly, which is why I wanted to write a column kind of elucidating my perverse admiration for Swalwell for being such a perfect personification of that certain sensibility within the party. So there's a column uh, that came out a couple days ago in The Spectator that I obviously will link to in the description box. But in the debate, Swalwell also said that uh, it's time to break up with Russia. Or we're breaking up with Russia under the Swalwell administration. Now, what does that mean? What is this? Is the close relationship that would need to be broken up? You can't really get him to to explain that when pressed. I mean, in January of this year, Swalwell went so far as to say definitively and matter-of-factly that Trump was a literal agent of Russia. So the sitting president, according to Swalwell, is an agent of Russia. That's the most dramatic far-fetched Manchurian candidate scenario that would have been mind-bogglingly implausible in any other scenario to, to uh, in any other era to, to actually assert. But Swalwell says it, and then you know, he actually is able to get enough traction to get in the debates. 
um, but anyway, so I was able to speak briefly to Swalwell. I had the distinct pleasure of interacting with him and interviewing him in South Carolina when I was there a while back. And the quotes from that interview are in the item in the spectator. But one thing that was on my mind when I was speaking to him is that he, in a New York Times feature that came out a couple weeks ago, where all the candidates were interviewed except Biden and, you know, Gravel, if you count him, um, all the candidates were asked something like 21 questions or 18 questions. And one of the questions had to do with whether you believe that Trump committed crimes with regard to the Russia investigation. And Swalwell, in that featurette, said, quote, I think it's very likely that President Trump has sealed indictments waiting for him. <laughs> now, the whole notion that there were sealed indictments ready to be foisted upon Trump at any moment was something that you saw in the fever swamps of resistance Twitter and Russia-obsessed Twitter for years prior to the Mueller report coming out. Because there was always these tea leaves that people read that Trump had another thing, you know, had coming, and all of a sudden there was going to be this bombshell revelation that he was actually under indictment and was going to be, you know, uh, escorted out of the White House in handcuffs or whatever. So the fact that Swalwell believed that was a real possibility suggests that his news consumption diet is pretty similar to your average crazy person on Twitter who was following every Russia development with a kind of panicked fervor. Um, but that New York Times featurette came out approximately two months after the Mueller report. And in the Mueller report, Mueller clarified that there were, in fact, no such sealed indictments. He explicitly dispelled that notion. So I wanted to know what the heck Swallow was talking about. And he claimed that uh, that New York Times interview that he did was before the Mueller report. And therefore, because there was no timestamp, it looked a little weird for him. I'm not quoting him directly. That's essentially what he said. You can read the full quote in the story that I'm linking to. Um, he also said that the reason why he had been relatively late in calling for impeachment proceedings to begin, at least compared to many of his colleagues in the House, is because he wanted to have, make sure all the information was there to actually initiate the proceedings appropriately with enough evidence. But this also made no sense and still doesn't after I asked him about it because... Swalwell has been one of the most aggressive in calling Trump a Russian agent and saying that he's appeasing Putin and likening the attack that Trump supposedly abetted and colluded with to a Pearl Harbor and 9-11. So how can you countenance a president who is guilty of those offensive offenses, allegedly, remaining in office? And Swalwell took, was really amped up the rhetoric on that front but hadn't actually called for impeachment proceedings until recently. And he did the day after Trump gave his interview with George Stephanopoulos, where he said that he would entertain the possibility of taking information from foreigners. And the example of a foreigner that he cited in that interview was Nor Norwegians. Okay, so Trump said if Norwegians call him on the phone and say, here's some information on your opponent, Trump will listen to it. And that caused... Swalwell to totally change his position on impeachment and the following day he was calling for it because according to me that meant that immediate action was taken to save our democracy because Trump said he was going to betray the country blah 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 of course it doesn't make any sense it's kind of useless to discern any kind of coherent logic to it but it still is amusing to observe because it actually is simpatico with a Sensibility that you often see among rank and file Democrats and some, especially Democratic media figures and some voters. Um, so, anyway, read that article. It's funny. Um, if this is our last time bearing witness to Swalwell on a national debate stage, I at least can be content that I was able to write a very mean and mocking piece about him while he was still technically a, an official candidate. 
So that'll do it for now, and I'll talk to you all later.